Hello, Greg Engel here. We want to welcome you to the uh, annual public meeting of the Friends of Korea. Some of you uh, were with us in the last half hour for the annual membership meeting, so the business meeting. Uh, the public meeting is a wonderful thing. It gives us a chance to, uh, to uh, share stories, have a, a wonderful plenary speaker to talk to us uh, uh, with regard to uh, topics related to, to Korea. And you know, just just to reach out beyond beyond the sort of business level membership uh, meeting. Uh, several of you have come to Austin. We really uh, are happy that you have, and we hope that number will grow uh, as we go forward. Uh, we're also grateful for those of you who are taking your time online to, to be with us today. And so, without further ado, it's my great honor to. <laughs> to present our president of the Prince of Korea, uh, Jerry Person. Oh, can I say one more thing? Please. So Jerry is nicely dressed in a blazer, some people have to say, I'm in what we call Austin formal. <laughs> Maybe you know the sound. Ohio informal. <laughs> Austin formal. Uh, I button my shirt. I'm wearing long pants and uh, you know, yeah, that's why right, right? Our speech, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it's shorts and this this uh, NPR t shirt, yeah. <laughs> and having been in Austin now for two days, I can tell you, Greg is dressed up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have been Anyashimnika, Kungang Hashijo. Welcome to the Friends of Korea public program. I think again, we have an exciting program for you. We're looking forward to Dr. Oppenheim's plenary. Uh, the and then next with Mr. Soki Khan, who's the recipient of the Kevin O'Donnell Award and uh, the uh, Giving Back Initiative that we have. So, without further ado, let's get into our plenary speaker. And you'll be speaking from here. Is this right there? Is this here? Okay. Yeah. That would be fine. And it's a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce uh, Professor Robert Robert Oppenheim. And you said it's calling him Robert Oppenheim. We probably have to be the, the POSCO um, chair in Korean studies here at UT. And POSCO, I have to look up, is the uh, you know, is like anybody else like that. You know what that is? POSCO is the Pohang. You, you do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he is going to talk to us today about the evolution of Korean studies uh, with the development of Korea. Uh, Professor Oppenheimer is the author of two uh, Korean related books. One's The Nation Frontier, American Anthropology and Korea, 1882 to 1945. And the other one is Kyungju Things Assembly in Place. Uh, his research interests include Nepal, Korea, um, labor migration, and student humanitarianism concerning North Korea. He's also the co editor of the University of uh, North Carolina Press Critical Studies in or Critical Studies in the History of Anthropology and uh, Journal of Modern Asian Studies. So after his remarks, there will be time for Q&A. Uh, but without further ado, I welcome you and join uh, Professor. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me just start by noting that um, you know, something of a sad week in Seoul because of uh, the, the tragedy, the, the big uh, Hollywood uh, Halloween celebration um, press um, at uh, in Itaewon on last week. Um, but um, you know, what I was asked to speak to you uh, about today um, is uh, the evolution of Korean studies with the development of Korea. Um, and it's interesting for me to know when to start the story, right? So one of the books that Greg mentioned, I in fact wrote a book on the early American anthropology of Korea uh, between 1882 and the end of the Japanese colonial era in 1945. Um, and one of my initial points was that there was more American anthropological interest uh, in Korea in this era than one might expect. 
um, along, of course, with much better documented Japanese and Korean studies of Korean culture uh, and history during the colonial period. There were also missionary studies built on early appreciations of classical Korean scholarship, travelers' accounts, and the like. Um, but none of these came to rest on an existing bed of philological interest, as had long existed for China and Japan, uh, and even more so for classical India on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and so, while the Cold War United States did have a broad project of knowing the world under the rubric of area studies, right, there was no special reason for the Korea to be a priority in this project. Um, nonetheless, there were some uh, there were a few key early appointments, including Chosun dynasty, dynasty historians like Edward Wagner at Harvard and James Pillay at the University of Washington, uh, as well as literature and language scholars such as Peter Lee at UCLA and Gary Ledyard at Columbia. Some had received their own first exposure to Korea during the post-war uh, U.S. occupation of the South or the Korean War. Um, but as the 1950s and 1970s wore on, um, and we can discuss memory on this, uh, but as the 50s and 70s wore on, there were other rumblings under the hood. Um, first, given my understanding of the Friends of Korea, uh, it deserves to be said that the next generation of U.S. scholars of the country significantly came into being through the Peace Corps in South Korea. Uh, several individuals that I'll mention below had that formative experience. I was looking before the talk at kind of the, the books you have over there, the bilingual uh, books on, uh, well, see, a lot of them on, on the Peace Corps in South Korea. Um, I'll, I'll throw another one out for you. I had to look this up on my phone a second ago, but um, there's a book edited by uh, Sung Young Kim and Michael Robinson entitled Peace Corps Volunteers and the Making of Korean Studies in the United States, which if you want to hear about, you know, the academic kind of, the academic influence of the Peace Corps. Are you in it? I, I forget. Are you in it? No. Okay. All right. Um, but whatever. Uh, you know, but but yeah, if you want to hear about kind of the broader academic um, you know, that's a book too. Um, all right. Uh, so yes. Uh, but second, beyond the, the Peace Corps, Influence. Um, South Korea itself was becoming uh, becoming academically interesting in a new way, right? You know, we could walk over to the LDJ archives right now. Okay, were they open? Um, and find documents dating from as late as the mid 1960s describing South Korea's economic prospects with such phrases as basket case and sinkhole for aid. Um, anthropologists of the era did sometimes frame their village studies around the concept of modernization in a somewhat pro forma fashion, uh, in line with the, the intellectual dominance of modernization theory in the period. But it wasn't always clear that this was going somewhere. Um, however, by the 1970s, if not before, uh, it was becoming obvious that South Korea's industrialization and economic transformation had legs. Um, explaining how that happened, why that happened, uh, and why in South Korea more than many other places became one of the signal projects of post-war Korean studies, culminating a decade or so later with the publication of such uh, indicatively titled works as Alice Amden's Asia's Next Giant and uh, Chung Un Woo's Race to the Swift. Of course, none of this happened without a political context or a social price. Uh, the development of Korean studies also existed in a complex dialogue with movements toward democracy in South Korea of the 1980s. Um, during the Vietnam War, uh, there came into being a critical branch of Asian studies scholarship that somewhat mirrored the growth of American popular discontent with the conflict in paying attention to ways in which that war was less an iteration of Cold War struggle, or at least it wasn't only that, uh, than it was also a civil war built on social divisions with deep colonial roots. Um, led by Ruth Cummings and his monumental two volumes, The Origins of the Korean War, Korean studies scholarship began asking, kind of through the Vietnam frame, similar retrospective questions about the process of Korean division after 1945 and the lead up to the Korean War itself. Now, much of this work was banned in authoritarian South Korea, uh, although some of versions did circulate. Um, but as Henry M has discussed, it eventually did spur, help spur, a critical Korean language scholarship 
that looked uh, critically at the actions of South Korean political elites and the support of the United States since 1945. And that scholarship in turn became part of the intellectual infrastructure of the democratic movement. Meanwhile, uh, scholars on the ground in South Korea, including in the city of Gwangju itself, helped spread news of the May 1980 uprising and massacre in that city. Um, others were reporting back that while South Korea was definitely experiencing economic growth, elements of Korean culture were not following the scripts of modernization. So, for example, Laurel Kendall's work on Korean shamanism uh, confirmed that whatever else might be happening uh, to this form of uh, popular religion, it was most definitely not fading away, as variations of the secularization thesis had been predicting for at least a century. Um, Roger Dinelli and Don Im looked into the heart, or at least the offices, of one of the Korean conglomerates, Chebol, uh, that, that, that were just beginning to become household names at the time, uh, gold household, uh, and found not Korean Confucian culture running on autopilot uh, to create harmonious hierarchy or something like that, but rather corporate executives clothing, clothing themselves in nation and tradition to justify their role in society and meeting considerable resistance from below while doing so. South Korea's democratic turn at the end of the decade of the 1980s made new forms of scholarship available and doable without significant risk to both Koreans and Americans. Yet other democratic shifts also impacted Korean studies. The study of the early development of the DPRK, for example, uh, or the, of the DPRK state under the auspices of Soviet occupation of the North after 1945 emerged as something of a branch of the Korean War scholarship I noted previously. Uh, indeed, there was and has been something of a cottage industry evolved around National Archives Record Group 242 and the captured North Korea documents that it contains for the window they provide onto the first five or so years of North Korea's development. Um, the DPRK's own archives were and remain closed to outsiders. Uh, but after the end of communism in Eastern Europe and the fall of the Soviet Union, new materials became avail available that shed light on the, on the event leading to the outbreak of fighting in 1950, on North Korea's post-war rebuilding, and on its broader interactions with the former so uh, socialist bloc. The internationalization of North Korean studies remains an ongoing process, as further research has probed the country's interactions with the non-aligned world and other states. Of course, archival opening is not a one-way street anywhere, really. And even at my non-specialist understanding of it is that the Russian archive, for example, uh, have, you know, were becoming more closed than they used to be, uh, even before the events of the past year. Um, but internationalization uh, is also a fair theme with which to begin a discussion of the more general direction of Korean studies since the 1990s. Uh, before this period, before the 1990s, only a relative few U.S. universities taught Korean language or courses on Korean history, literature, society, culture, or politics. Now many more do, and the number continues to increase. Over the same time frame, Korean studies, in some form or another, has expanded as a, as a university-level topic throughout the world, such that it can now be founded, and this was just off the top of my head, Australia, New Zealand, many or most countries in Asia, many in Europe, several in the Middle East and Latin America, and a couple in Africa as well. Um, I would like to say that this expansion of the field occurred simply because universities around the world saw South Korea's economic vibrancy, democratic shift, and increasing cultural importance, that they noticed also their students clamoring for more Korean content due to these reasons and more, that Korean American students and the equivalent in other countries also made their voices heard and staked a claim to academic representation, and that these universities acted accordingly by building Korea programs. Um, all of these elements were indeed part of the story, but they're not the whole story, because in an era in which universities the world over are in general not flush with cash, uh, in which government support for higher education has waned, and in which humanities major verges on being an epithet in some parts, nothing, nothing, especially nothing new gets built without money, and money there has been. Since the 1990s, through several public and semi-public organs, most notably the Korea Foundation and the Academy of Korean Studies, 
the South Korean government had made a strong and sustained effort to support the development of Korean studies worldwide and has backed that effort up with funding for physicians, students, and research. Um, on occasion, this has been controversial within South Korea for reasons similar to why spending tax dollars on international public diplomacy and overseas aid can be controversial in the US. But the Korean officials engaged in these efforts will tell you that they think it's worth it to take South Korea's global visibility, reputation, and to use the, the parlance of the moment, soft power. Uh, I mean, I think they're right. I certainly hope they are. Uh, but in any case, my point is that the internationalization and expansion of Korean studies itself has not happened in a vacuum. It's involved support, financial, and otherwise, from South Korea. Um, and there are some contrasting examples you could know. Uh, in Texas at UT, where I teach, uh, well, in Texas, where I teach, English is the most spoken language and Spanish is fact. I'll bet you knew or could have predicted that. Uh, in third place is Vietnamese, which might be news to some, right? Despite this being the case, Vietnamese language is not taught at my university, and there are a few Vietnam-related courses as well. Well, why not? Well, one short answer is because there's no Vietnam Foundation or the equivalent, no institution to push for Vietnam, for Vietnam studies and to back that financially. Beyond describing the spread of Korean studies to new locations, uh, internationalization, my theme, uh, is also a fine block for a set of changes in South Korean society that came to a head in the 1990s and for some related shifts in the direction of research on Korea. Of course, both Koreas had in many senses been international long before. Um, even if one takes the 19th century trope of Chosun Dynasty Korea as a hermit kingdom at face value, which one probably should not, um, after 1876, the country was inundated by foreign diplomats, missionaries, and adventurers of various stripes, even as an initial trickle of Koreans left the country to experience and uh, experience life abroad and to study abroad. The first large-scale migration of Korean laborers, uh, for instance, to Hawaii, also occurred in this period. Um, whatever else that it meant, annexation by Japan in 1910 brought Koreans into a multi-ethnic empire articulated with the global economy and permeated by international cultural trends, including modernism, surrealism, Dadaism, and slapper era feminism. Uh, it also brought a lot of out migration, much of it forced. Uh, some 20% of Koreans were outside the country's borders when colonialism ended in 1945. I've already alluded to North Korea's articulation of the socialist bloc and the non-aligned world during the Cold War. For the South, the Cold War meant deep and broad connections with the United States, a set of other articulations with regional non-communist states, as well as direct participation in the Vietnam War. There were new labor migrations also, including, for, for instance, of nurses and coal miners to Germany and construction workers to the Middle East, as well as the complicated case of Korean overseas adoption. Uh, emigration to the United States also increased after the 1965 Immigration Act. Um, against all of the background, though, all of these other examples of internationalization in the past, um, what the 1990s did bring um, was increased economic capacity and political uh, freedom to travel abroad for vast swaths of South Koreans uh, and travel abroad. They increasingly did. Um, the 1990s was when I began my own research, uh, and I was always fascinated by the demographics of South Korean backpack travel, quote unquote which involved not only 20-somethings on holiday or gap year off, seeing the world a la the Lonely Planet stereotype, but also 50 or 60-year-olds who had never been able to travel before, suddenly venturing themselves to Dutch hostels and Balinese temples. Right? The 1990s was also the beginning of large-scale labor migration and marriage migration to South Korea, mostly from other Asian countries, with the result that South Korea began to become a slightly more ethnically and culturally diverse society. At the same time, I'm sorry, at the time, some of these trends were given a policy rubric by the Kim Young Sang government's official globalization policy. Since then, in fits and starts, and not, of course, without bumps along the way, South Korea has to an increasing extent begun to see itself as a multicultural Hamanba nation. Um, now, Korean study scholarship from roughly the same 1990s moment has engaged these historical and present day aspects of the Korean international day and more. Uh, but to pick up a theme from earlier, I don't want to portray this as simply a natural occurrence. 
Um, it's too dismissive, I think, to say that scholarship is trendy, but neither is it the case that scholarship is a neutral register of real world events. What scholars focus on depends a good deal on what is seen as interesting within evolving scholarly conversation. Um, thus, the internationalization of the topics of Korean studies from the 1990s onward has had a lot to do also with shifts in the academy itself. So let me note three. Um, first, by the 1990s, fields like history and anthropology had developed a self-critique of the methodological nationalism of previous studies. And this led to some emphasis on the study of globalization and subsequently transnational phenomena in a way that dovetailed nicely with new Korean developments. Second, perhaps somewhat more subtly, um, historians of empires and imperialists turned, turned around this moment towards trying to understand empire on the ground from the margin or with similar phrases, um, which led to a confluence of interest between Korea, Korean and Japanese studies and efforts to trace the Japanese empire's transnational dynamics through the lens of Korea. And third, Asian American studies and similar themes stopped focusing somewhat exclusively on assimilation, discrimination, identity, and other components of being Asian in the US and started noting also the ongoing transnational aspects of many Asian American experiences. Yet notwithstanding all that I've said about the self-conscious internationalization of South Korea during the 1990s um, and about how Korean studies was newly prepared to follow these dynamics, uh, I would not have predicted at the end of that decade, the end of the 1990s, that South Korea would become what it is now, um, increasingly a cultural a touchstone around the world and a tourism destination, as it were, the new hot mecca in Asia. Um, what happened, of course, was the Korean wave, or as some scholars might prefer, the Korean waves, uh, the, the growing regional and then global fascination with Korean cultural products, initially films, then dramas, <laughs> then music, K-pop, um, with gaming or esports also an element, if you like that kind of thing. Uh, I'm not an expert on any of this, um, and during earlier stages of these phenomena, I will admit to some frustration with, with popular and scholarly accounts whose analysis, analyses could sometimes be summarized as, OMG, they like us, they really do. <laughs> but since then, uh, there has developed good Korean wave scholarship, rather a lot of it, actually. Um, the Korean sociologist Choi Jung more or less asked the question, what do South Koreans see when they see the Korean wave? Others have examined the conjunction of Korean cultural flows with the politics of cultural consumption in various settings, right? In Japan, for instance, Korean dramas are said to model a softer masculinity than is depicted in Japanese media. In places like Nepal and Northeast India, K-pop looks are resources for the construction of subnational ethnic identities and ethnic movements. In Southeast Asia, but as far afield as Latin America, the family dynamics that Korean dramas depict are sometimes felt as more familiar and experienced near than those seen, for example, in Hollywood productions. Writing about K-pop fans in Mexico City, Erica Vogel has considered the important issue of how much they see this music as representative of Korea as all, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a more generic global way of being, right? Um, other scholars have, other studies have examined industries and platforms, right? How are Korean wave products and Korean wave stars, because the star system reminds me of like old Hollywood, made and through what pathways do they actually find their audience? Um, I don't know how long the Korean wave will last, uh, and frankly, it's sometimes a worry for those in the field. Um, I was at a conference in August where this was like an element of discussion. Um, what happens when the students stop coming in droves? I do think, though, that the development of Korean studies in conjunction with the development of Korea has created a field that no longer represents an odd affectation in the context of the U.S. Academy that it's fully in contact with broader scholarly trends. Subfields, conversations, and topics, you know, the layer of the story that I've presented, continue to be enriched in unexpected ways. New work in environmental history and environmental humanities, for instance, is having an impact on scholarship in both pre-modern and contemporary Korea, right? One of the most fascinating articles I've read in the last couple of years is by uh, John Lee. Oh, I think that's right. 
And um, it's about how Korea went from being a nation of oaks to a nation of pines sometime between the Koryo period and the Joseon period, great art. Um, anyway, the Koreas remain a complicated place, right? Just to couple South Korean economic vibrancy with the ongoing tragedies and ever a possible catastrophe stemming from Korean division, or to note the global popularity of the Korean wave and South Korea's suicide rate, highest of all OECD countries in the same breath, is to hint at some of the dimensions of this complexity. Uh, but I think that Korean studies is well prepared to consider its aspects in years to come. So, thank you. So greetings, everybody. My name is Paul Cartwright, and I'm going to moderate the Q&A. Uh, Katerina will get any questions that we have from online folks. So do you have any questions now, or should we just go ahead and open it up to the floor here? Uh, no, we don't have any online questions, but for our online participants, uh, please use the raise hand function or leave your question in the chat, and we'll call on you and ask you to turn on your video and uh, address your speaker. Wonderful. So for the crowd here, questions that you would have for our speaker today? Yes, Danny? Yeah, Professor uh, Um, So I, I hate to put you on a question that you explicitly said was unknowable, but it concerns the future of Korean studies. Sure. Um, I think, you know, um, being someone situated in between Japanese studies and Korean studies, I, I think it, um, it makes me curious, at very least, um, whether Korean studies might be following a, a similar path. For uh, Bruce Cummings, there was a, a similar um, leftist revolution within academia with uh, John Dower. Um, for you know the Korean wave, there was there was a similar Japanese wave um, having um, Japanese modernization as well, and um, kind of we've seen a waning of uh, institutional support uh, from. Japan. Uh, Japan Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, just uh, being uh, kind of um, uh, fully invested in the field, is that something that you see people predicting, like a, a, a gradual waning of Korean studies and a, a less um, kind of investment in the field overall? I don't know that they're predicting it. I mean, I think that, um, well, what are the worries? The worries are twofold. The worries are that, you know, um, the Korean wave might not last forever, right? So, you know, students may, may, may not be flocking to our classes because, you know, they have an interest in, you know, webtoon scanlation or whatever it is, um, as much as they, 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 they do in the past. And second, that, you know, um, uh, universities are always happy to accept money. Right, um, but but you know, has that translated into the institutionalization of um, of Korea position? Um, now, I will say, you know, and I think this is to their credit, you know, the Korea Foundation drives a hard bargain, right? Which is to say that they, you know, they ask that positions that they help establish be permanently established, right? And so, so to some degree, I think that that I'm mean, hoping that that will will work, you know, whatever happens with the Korean wave in the next 10 years or something. Uh, um, and I do think that, you know, the field is more of a contributor to broader scholarly conversations, um, environmental history, um, 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 you know, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a global early modern that people sometimes talk about in history. Um, you know, and, and of course, media studies. I mean, you know, the, the Korean wave has put Korean studies kind of at the center of media studies discussions um, in such a way that I think they're, I'm hoping that people will continue to push for, um, you know, uh, uh, support for Korean uh, studies in the future, no matter what happens, right? So yeah, I know, I still can't answer, but, but those are my, those are my, both my worries and kind of my, my the guideposts of where I could be hoping. okay? Anything? Can yes, uh, we do. We have a question from Bruce Fulton. Uh, if you'd like to turn on your camera and ask your question yourself. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, let me have put Bruce on the. Uh, let's see, a second. Okay. 
Bruce, if you can unmute yourself. Hi. Bruce, we can't hear you. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you, Robert. Um, I I can't I can't remember the last time we met. I think it was ten or fifteen years ago. But, yeah. Um, it's uh, it's always nice to to uh, to get this kind of perspective on um, uh, connections between the U.S. and and, and Korea. And I'm um, as you may know, I was one of the contributors to the um, the volume that was uh, edited by by Sung Young and um, Mike and um, I find that one of the ways in which my students at UBC engage with the Korean literary tradition is through life stories. Yeah, and uh, this is what I see as the as the primary value in this edited volume. And I was wondering, uh, I, I'd be interested in hearing your uh, how you engaged with this volume and with the stories of the individuals that you read? Um, how I engaged with the volume. Um, well, all right, I was one of the press reviewers for it, so I suppose <laughs> that, that one way. Um, but, um, you know, I, 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 um, I, I mean, I will mention, I don't remember the details of, of each individual story, certainly. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do come back to a lot of the stories around um, Gwangju um, as being, um, you know, uh, 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 certainly interesting stories uh, or, or, you know, uh, some of the, the more um, revealing stories to come out of that volume. Um, and um, I mean, I think I was talking to where's Greg? Where's Greg? I think I was talking to Greg about this when um, I uh, I uh, saw him in August. That you know there was some of the stories there are about you know people being frustrated with the control that, for example, Fulbright or the embassy was was exercising over them, and um, you know wanting to um, spread the news in different ways. Um, uh, I, you know, I also appreciate some of the stories as to how people got into the field. Um, I, I don't know if he has it in this volume, but, you know, I remember another story that Clark, you probably know this, you know, story that Clark Sorensen tells of kind of, you know, the, the, the um, I guess it's both a discipline story and an area story where, you know, um, it, it's, it, uh, uh, he tells the story of how he came to anthropology under um, uh, under uh, James Pillay at Washington, and kind of you know uh, the the um, uh, Pillay's preference for kind for anthropology as a discipline, um, but also kind of you know one of the, the other part of his story is how you know in that era people would come to Korea for the first time, and um, you know he he ran the map on his plane ticket, and it cost something like you know ten thousand dollars in contemporary U.S. terms. And, um, you know, there being a vast difference from that kind of landing in Korea uh, experience, which is probably what a lot of human Peace Corps experience, also what a lot of anthropologists of that generation, in some cases the same people, um, experience. Um, and, you know, the kind of the back and forth with, you know, the, the many trips to Korea that one, that, that one makes before, you know, you become a professional on the topic, which is kind of my generation. Experience, right? Um, so, yeah, um, it was Utah. In uh, it, it took me a second. It was that strange Utah conference where they put the Southwest and the Pacific AAS together in like 2010. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think we're Utah. Okay. So I'm going to ask a quick question. Oh, right. So there's the development of Korean studies within the U.S. and Canada. But there's also, you know, academic developments within Korea of Korea studies and and also studies of other countries. How much of an overlap or, or of a mix has there been, or, or do you think there's a potential for so more of a collaboration between academics between the countries? Um, you know, I think I, I, there is there is a good deal of overlap, and that overlap goes back, um, uh, you know, a, a long way. Um, I mean, I. Um, 
um, uh, you know, certainly, certainly in, in fields like my own, like anthropology, you know, you can go back to the 1960s and people were working with um, members of the anthropological community, which is already kind of coming into being within Korea. Um, you know, people go back and forth, um, you know, for conferences and things like that. Um, you know, it's, it, I mean, language remains an issue. You know, language remains a, a divide in some cases, uh, you know, the language of scholarship, I mean. Um, but there are, you know, there are various efforts to, to, to bridge that um, in that, you know, things do get translated. Um, uh, and, and they get translated, and, you know, they, 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 there are perhaps certain places where they could be translated more. Um, but, you know, just off the top of my head, there, there for example, um, an anthropology journal now, Public out of Seoul National University that specializes in translating Korean anthropological articles into English for broader international um, visibility. Any other questions from the group online? Um, no, not right now. Um, okay. There's one in the. <laughs> I remember when, again, we were going for Peace Corps training and. I'm talking about the late 70s now, and I think articles that Peace Corps sent us were Richard Rutt's Korean Works and Days, Vincent Brandt's Korean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brand. Brand was one of the people I was to come back. Yeah, and those were basically the only sources of information we had in English. So, in your comments about the explosion of more material in English and the scholarship, yeah, to me has been astounding you know, yeah. over the years that I've seen. But, and you've, you've somewhat answered this, but I just wanted to get your view 1980s you were in japanese studies chinese studies that's where all the money was brain studies there's no money now you're seeing more money in that now within in the major research universities is it still china japan korea or are you seeing some movement between those three as far as political cloud funding that's coming in um you yourself when i was looking at your resume too you're teaching a lot of different courses about it. Not at the same time. Not at the same time, <laughs> right. But you're teaching a lot of different courses about Korea where um, sometimes if you look at the Chinese and Japanese studies department, they have these really quite a few specialists in that. So any other comment that you have about that? Um, you know, I, I, I think there is a way in which, you know, interest reproduce interest, right? So mm -hmm. in that sense, um, you know, Chinese and Japanese studies are much more entrenched in the American university. In some cases, for you know, in some cases, going back to I forget when Yale, you know, started mm -hmm. Chinese studies. But that's like the twenties or even before that. I forget. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, I think Korean studies is in general much much newer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and perhaps there are some departments where it is still kind of unthinkable. Mm -hmm. that Korean studies would ever be in the lead. And, you know, of course, there's also, um, there are also new imperatives for studying China, which has existed for the past, well, for a while now. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I guess I don't see that as being a, 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 as much of a problem. I don't see that being that great of a problem. I, I, um, I think that, you know, universities have been increasingly, you know, there are some exceptions, um, some famous exceptions, but but um, univer universities in general have been more willing to kind of um, you know follow student interest into Korean studies, um, and um, that also means in some cases following external funding into, into Korean studies. Okay. Yeah, could you elaborate more on Korean studies in Japan? How it has evolved, um, given the history. Yeah, has it been, have it, Koreans been instrumental in facilitating developing the studies there, or is the Japanese essentially have gone over to Korea? Are there biases, or have the biases sort of <laughs> diminished as time has gone on? Yeah, Maybe you can elaborate. A bit. I mean, okay, so one, this is not a topic I'm I, I'm very good on. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, you know, Japanese scholarship on Korea was, there was a huge volume of staff Japanese scholarship on Korea um, during the corner, right? Um, you know, 
some people, uh, some scholars in Korea would say that, you know, a lot of it was empirically very good. I mean, I'm thinking of things like archaeology. Some of the archaeology was, you know, in terms of, and, and the thing about archaeology, archaeology, you can never do it twice, right? But, you know, some of it had, you know, was, was pretty good, pretty accurate, pretty, you know, pretty, pretty well designed for the period. Um, and yet, um, getting out of, getting out from under the bias, the colonial biases, the, the, um, the, the kind of, um, um, uh, in, in the same way that, um, you know, uh, um, well, getting out from under the bias of colonial scholarship, right, was one of the major projects of a lot of Korean scholarship um, in the post-war era, the 1950s, 1960s, um, et cetera. Um, so I think that probably in Japan nowadays, I mean, the, the, the scholars of Korea in Japan that I know of, yes, there are some Koreans who have gotten appointments there, but there are also a lot of Japanese scholars who just have, have just have focused on Korea. Um, and I don't know institutionally how much, you know, that's in kind of continuity with positions that were originally established during the colonial era. Um, but I think that they are, you know, that, that um, um, uh, they're very cognizant of those critiques in general. Um, and, you know, I think many, um, um, you know, uh, Japanese anthropology of Korea, for instance, remains, you know, a very kind of, you know, empirically solid um, and, 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 and conceptually interesting, but a very kind of empirically solid. Um, so that's not really an answer, but, but I, I, I think that, you know, that problem perhaps is less than it used to be. Any, are we online? No. Nope. No. Nope. Nope. Okay. Oh, one more, too. What sure. about the Korean diaspora in Central Asia, uh, in other places? What's what's going on in research there? I'm a graduate student. No. Um, what's going on in research there? Um, well, I mean, there have been, uh, there are some some uh, scholars um, who very often are from that community and, and had uh, some position or another within the Soviet Academy, um, whether they're still the Soviet Academy, um, there's a scholar in Vladivostok, um, right off the top of my head there, I think there's there are some in Kazakhstan. Um, you know, there have been some developments of that community uh, uh, because, you know, uh, they have been, uh, the, the, the Soviet Korean community in places like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan were significantly encouraged by Korean immigration policy to, you know, join things like labor migration waves in Korea. Uh, and so there are now a lot of those, um, you know, former um, Soviet citizens in Korea itself. In some cases, they've also moved back to the Russian Far East, where a lot of them were from before um, Stalin sent them to Central Asia in the 30s. Um, and so, yes, there, 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 there is um, a lot of scholarship. And there, there, there's, there's at least a decent amount of scholarship on that community. Because of the language requirements, it tends to come out of um, Soviet, you know, former Soviet, ex-Soviet Korean studies, or to people who come through, you know, um, who people who speak Russian because they've come from there. Um, and, um, you know, um, yes, and that's a well developed, you know, um, uh, field as well. In, in, in I was curious myself your comment about uh, Korean studies and, and the engagement with, within Africa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what you see, I, I do most of my work within Africa, is that in fact, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative has a huge impact socioeconomically, but it has a very limited impact in yeah. terms of cultural engagement. And that people actually seem to look to Korea more than they look to China in terms of, of interpersonal relationships and engagement. I'm just curious your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, not an expert. I mean, the the, the conference I, I was at, you know, earlier or late in the summer, you know, there were people who were there representing Korean studies in Egypt, where it seems you know fairly well institutionalized. And I believe the other, you know, there's somebody there who was representing, um, you know, teaching Korean, uh, and I want to say in Cote d'Ivoire, 
Um, but but that had I wasn't I'm not sure if that I don't remember very well whether that was kind of a permanent thing or um, you know more more temporary. Um, I think you know relative to the way that China is seen, um, I think sometimes uh, Korea, South Korea. Um, actually, we, we, we go back to the 1970s when South Korea and South Korea and North Korea are battling for um, political and economic influence and votes in the UN or, or potential votes in the UN. Not there is in the UN yet, but kind of you know for for alliances, right? With you know in Africa, in part, right? Um, but nowadays, I think that you know South Korea sometimes benefits uh, from being seen as you know less threatening and. Um, more culturally appealing um, than China, and probably in Africa as in other places. Great. Uh, in your remarks, you talked about uh, labor migration into Korea and how it started increasing sort of multicultural uh, uh, society or outlook there. In your research, you specifically mentioned Nepal, Korea labor migration can you is there anything special about that combination or oh it's special about that color sorry can I, yeah what's special about that combination is that we did it together right uh -huh. so she the nepal specialist and i you know and so oh, okay. so we could kind of put that together and um 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 what's special about nepal um you know probably there's not that much special about nepal relative to um, several other states that have kind of a similar position in the system, you know, relative to Bangladesh, let's say, relative maybe to, you know, the Philippines. Um, South Korea did, um, they shifted from a Japanese style system that nominated, that that pretended that everybody were, 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 were trainees, right? In which case they didn't have to be treated as, um, you know, real laborers with rights. Um, Shifted from that to a system in which you know they were brought in at least officially, you know, sometimes there were violations and whatnot, but given kind of more labor rights protection. Um, but that system also nominated, you know, it, it kind of created arrangements, bilateral arrangements with a group of mostly Asian countries, right? And it's interesting who was on the list and who was not on, the list. you know, Nepal was on the list, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Um, much of Southeast Asia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan again, um, East Timor for some reason. Um, but you know, but it wasn't really beyond kind of the, the broader Asia basin. And India, for example, was not, right? Um, so you know, so Nepal is one of a class of countries that had a specific relation to the labor migration mechanism starting around 2010. And was there has there been number one? Did a lot of those folks stay? And number two, was their intermarriage with, with Koreans? Some have stayed, and there was some intermarriage. Um, the other thing that's happened, though, is a separate kind of dynamic of marriage migration, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. you know the social crisis is, or uh, and please hear the quote marks here. The social crisis is that um, you know uh, um, um, men in the countryside are having difficulty finding wives, right? And um, so, therefore, there have been various efforts to bring in um, potential brides for them, which usually has come not from, you know, not from South Asia so much as from Southeast Asia or among the Korean population in um, China, right? The, the Chosun Chow um, population in China, which is another big group of um, people coming for, yeah, coming to Korea. Any other questions? And secondly, are, how are we in terms of time? We are very, very well in time. Very well in time. Very well in time. So we don't have any other questions from our online audience. Okay. Good. Any questions that you'd like to ask? <laughs> <laughs> I've got quite a range of experience here. No. Um, 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 uh, well, Yes. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry. Not, not off the top of my head. Um, well, okay, well, fine. How, uh, I'll just ask the room the exact online would be a little crazy, but, uh, you know, are you, are you, how, some of you are Peace Corps, I know. How did the rest of you come to Korea, interested in Korea? Um, you mentioned John Lee earlier. Yeah. Um, 
He was uh, my next door neighbor. We did full right together. Yeah, okay, okay. all right, 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 um, right. Uh, I'm back at yeah, uh, Cal State for this time. Yeah, okay, and, right. Um, cool. I did my PhD with one of your students, uh, Harry Chen. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's right. right. Um, different advisors. You different advisor, yeah, but but okay. So so that at um at so let's talk. Yeah, okay, cool. Oh, uh, family history. My grandmother is Korean. She's from Seoul. Okay. Through my grandfather, who was an American soldier, they ended up uh, getting married. My mother was born in Korea, and then I lived in Seoul for four years myself. Yeah. Yeah. I was in the Peace Corps in 76 or 78 as a volunteer with my wife, but I met there. Peace Corps. Yeah. Hold on. 1968. Um, the third program. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm not good at like Peace Corps generations, you know, the one. So 1968, uh, the first group went in 1966. Yeah. Right. Well, the third group went in mid six. So those early single digit numbers yeah. represent the uh, pioneers of Peace Corps Korea. Okay. Yeah. We were in the program together. We got married there. Okay, so also three. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, okay. oh, yeah. Right. Well, uh, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. I was in the the penultimate group <laughs> uh, in in the Peace Corps. I was there from eighty to eighty one with my wife, uh -huh. but we only got to serve uh, sort of half of our two year service because Peace Corps. Uh, ended in Korea in 1981. So, yeah, that's great. Uh, so we, we were the, the puppies of the group, I suppose. I was in South Korea from uh, 1974 uh, to 76. And then I went back there and worked with Care Korea okay. for one year. And then just related to the Korean Peninsula, I lived, I was a consultant in North Korea for six months oh. in 1998 and 1999. Right. Um, they're during the emergency. With the NGO or? Embankment rehabilitation. Oh, okay. wow. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating, yeah. Um, uh, yes, so I have a couple of people online. So oh, okay. we have uh, Diane O'Dell, who was there from uh, 66 to 68, K1. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also have Michael Travis, K1 from 66 to 68, and who was in Diego from 66 to 69. Yeah, and uh, I was a Fulbright English teaching assistant in, in 2011 to 2013. Yeah. yeah. And I was Peace Corps from 79 to 81, so yeah. before Greg, but not too long before Greg. No. Um, we knew each other. Yeah. yeah. I was there 77 to 80. Saw the transition from Pak Ching Yi to Chen Duan. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as Chen Duan came on television, even though he was in the military, you knew that's the next president. Yeah. 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 We come down to a very important part of uh, of our program, uh, the annual presentation of the O'Donnell Award. And although, uh, generally speaking, an important part of our family uh, activities. And so Danny Kim is going to uh, introduce who we have. Yes. We do. Okay, good. Uh, um, uh, Saki Kao. Uh, and then talk also a little bit about the award. Is that correct? I will introduce you. Okay, go ahead and use Okay, so uh, Friends of Korea is uh, pleased to announce that uh, Mr. Saki Kang of Irvine, California, uh, is the recipient of the 2022 Kevin O'Donnell Distinguished Friends of Korea Award. And now this award is a, um, it honors individuals who have contributed significantly to fostering cultural awareness and friendship between Americans and Koreans. And uh, as a representative of the selection committee, I am uh, honored to um, offer this award to Mr. Kong. Uh, Mr. Kong embodies the spirit of Kevin O'Donnell as he dedicated his life and service to others in the private and public sectors. 
Uh, Mr. Khan has served on a variety of organizations, uh, such as the Korean American Scholarship Foundation, the Korean American Community Fund, and the Orange County branch of uh, Korean American Corporation. Uh, from 2004 to 2008, he was elected to the Irvine City Council and followed that by being elected for two terms as mayor of Irvine. Um, he became the first Korean American to serve as a mayor of a major U.S. city. Um, he was recently elected as president of the Korean American for Political Action Organization, a nonpartisan committee that encourages the Korean American community to become involved in the American political process, which uh, given our uh, recent um, political milieu is a uh, very crucial work. Uh, the inspiration for Mr. Kong's service um, actually came from his experiences as an immigrant to the United States and uh, very importantly, as a witness to the Los Angeles riots of 1992. In his book, The Power of Possibility, My American Journey, he states, uh, quote, 1992 changed my life. Out of the flames of destruction came my personal inspiration to build, to build coalitions, to build friendships, to bridge gaps and create trust, to focus on the strength that diversity holds if we work together, not apart. I became deeply involved politically and in community service. In both passions, you build foundations to strengthen people and community. At the same time, you break down walls of misunderstanding and misery. As you develop a position of strength and observation, you need both a steady hand and a compassionate heart. So please join uh, the Friends of Korea in honoring uh, Mr. Tomsky. Well, thank you so much for the honor. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Suki Kang in Korean, Kang Seok Ki. Mm -hmm. And uh, first and foremost, thank you so much for selecting me as the 2022 Kevin O'Donnell Distinguished Friends of Korea Award recipient. I am truly humbled and honored to receive it. It is an even greater honor to be placed in such distinguished ranks as those of the past honorees who have had such illustrious achievements in fostering cultural awareness and friendship between Americans and Koreans. The, the linchpin of Friends of Korea. As uh, you may have heard, I uh, was born and raised and educated in Korea before I came to the United States in 1977 as a young adult. And I have spent much of my adult life dedicated to countering the isolation that is so prevalent among immigrant communities, regardless of their uh, origins. So this year, uh, as you may remember, commemorates the 30 year anniversary of the Los Angeles riots. 1992 Saigu LA riots truly inspired me to do a lot of introspection. So clearly there was no excuse for what Korean Americans endured during those difficult times. Hundreds of small businesses were burned to the ground and large segments of the Korean community were destroyed and traumatized. I soon came to realize that Korean Americans needed to break out of the self-imposed isolation due to language and cultural barriers that had kept us from fully embracing life in the United States. So in fact, as you mentioned, uh, 1992 indeed changed my life. I became deeply involved in politics and community service and I had decided to run for city council where my vote could really make a difference. But you know, with a, a low name ID, I had no other choice but to launch a doorstep dialogue where I personally knocked on 20,000 doors to meet with voters one at a time. As a result, I earned the trust of the Irvine voters and was elected to the Irvine city council. And subsequently, I ran for mayor and had a pleasure of becoming the first Korean American mayor in a major city and was privileged to be reelected. 
So what I learned most during my public service was that representation really matters. And I always served with diversity, equity, and inclusion at the forefront of my priorities. So at this time, I'd like to thank all the members of Friends of Korea for your great work in promoting intercultural relationship between Americans and Koreans. Also, I'd like to especially thank the members of Friends of Korea who served as Peace Corps volunteers in Korea between 1966 to 1981. Your contribution to the development of Korea on a person-to-person -person basis had much more impact than you will ever realize. Matter of fact, I'm proud to say that I was one of the beneficiaries of the English education I received by those selfless Peace Corps volunteers while I was attending college in Seoul. I was lucky enough to have opportunities to interact with Peace Corps teachers with English dramas, English speech contests, and many other activities in the early 1970s. So you have made a lasting impact on the students you taught, the ones you provided health care, the special education teachers, and your coworkers during your service in Korea. The truth of the matter is that you provided a foundation in language, culture, and genuine friendship that permeates the fabric of Korea even today. So I am forever grateful for your contributions during your service in Korea. And once again, being the recipient of the 2022 Kevin O'Donnell Distinguished Friends of Korea Award is an incredible honor. My family and I will cherish it for a long time. So thank you so much for this honor. Thank you. Well, Mayor Tom, uh, congratulations on uh, winning this well-deserved award for, for your uh, service and the recognition of what you had to accomplish uh, in, in American career relations. And, uh, so we really appreciate that. We're also glad that you know, I'm going to be this way. Uh, we're also glad that you could be with us this afternoon. We wish you were here in person, but we're very grateful that uh, that uh, you could be uh, at least online with us. So congratulations again, and I think from all of us. Thank you so much. Now uh, we have yet another very important. Uh, uh, part uh, of the Friends of Korea program, which is the Giving Back program. And I think Jerry might have mentioned earlier on that we've given $77,000 70, to uh, since um, 2014 in grants uh, to various organizations. And this year, uh, we're very pleased to be able to give a grant to an organization here in Austin, which is the Austin. Austin Asian, Asian Community Health, Health Initiative. Community Health Initiative. So uh, I'm very happy about that. And I know the organization will be very happy about that. And we're going to, uh, there you go. Uh, Janice Petty is going to come up and, and talk about uh, both the program and the organization. Yeah. And we'll see you very much. Right now. So the Giving Back Initiative was launched in 2014 when uh, members of the Friends of Korea Board expressed support for a more organized approach to service and philanthropy. And the goal of this initiative is to move Friends of Korea to a deeper level of engagement with the many Korean communities and organizations, institutions active both in the United States and in Korea. We're committed to supporting organizations and institutions that provide essential social services to members of the Korean American community, as well as to institutions and other organizations whose activities foster greater understanding between Americans and Koreans. This year's recipient, as Greg indicated, 
is the Austin Asian Community Health Initiative, AACHI. The Community Health Navigation Program provides healthcare navigation for Austin's vulnerable Asian subpopulations, including the Burmese, Korean, Nepali, Vietnamese, Syrian, Iraqi, and other Arabic-speaking communities. The services that they offer include patient advocacy, health navigation education, interpretation, translation support, referrals to local resources, eligibility and application assistance. Uh, this is the specifically the AACHI community health workers can help people with the eligibility and other application processes of several health coverage and other programs, which you know we all know can be very um, complicated to navigate. The Friends of Korea is pleased to award AACHI $5,000 to continue their work. We wish them the very best in all their endeavors in serving the Asian community in the Austin area. Mm -hmm. I guess my final duty, other than uh, to organize our dinner tonight, we're sorry for those uh, online who can't uh, <laughs> join us at a, at a very good local uh, Korean restaurant, one that's a throwback to our time in Korea. It's really a, I don't know if they call it holding a it's very nice, modest. Uh, here, but but other, otherwise, this is the close of our annual uh, public meeting, Friends of Korea. And we're going to ask Gary, we're in the, we're in Austin is the uh, live music capital of the world, self proclaimed, but legitimately so. And, and what we say in the concerts is, you know, we got Gary to come and take it out, you know, yeah. take us out. <laughs> Really, Greg Engel is the musician. He should be taking us up. <laughs> and uh, uh, also, I'd like to say, if you want to go on YouTube, uh, Google Greg Engel too. You're going to come up with some wonderful music too, including Korea. And we song Korea. about Korea and Peace Corps volunteers. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to uh, thank Greg for your organizing uh, this event for us. It it is historic in a way. It's the first time after COVID for us to get together again. We look forward to next year when um, we'll go to another part of the United States and get together and learn more about Korea. I'd also like to thank Dr. Oppenheim for coming today. And, you know, and despite your busy schedule and giving us a, a very wonderful overview of what's happened with Korean studies over these years too. I know with the books you've mentioned too, I'm gonna to go back and start looking at these articles and books you mentioned as well. Uh, I'd like to also congratulate uh, Mr. Khan for his award is truly deserved. If you want to read more about him, uh, he has his book. Let's show that right up here. Yes, thank you very much. It's in Korean and English, and it's The Power of Possibility, an aptly titled book for Mr. Cotton. If you want to talk about the value of immigration in the United States, look no further than this publication. Um, I'd also like to congratulate the Austin Asian Community Health Initiative, too, for their wonderful work. And we're just delighted to be able to support them as well. And um, before we sign off too, I'd like again, express our condolences to the people of Korea for what happened in Itaewon as well. That's something we had just experienced a revisit in Korea in the morning that I was leaving Seoul. I heard that horrific news and what had been a very delightful week was tinged with sorrow. And so we hope that uh, best wishes and our sincerest condolences to the people of Korea. So uh, in closing, uh, if you want to become a member of Friends of Korea, www.friendsofkorea.net, uh, learn about our work and uh, how we contribute to the continuing third goal of Peace Corps, informing Americans about the host country we spend time in, in that case is Korea. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed dinner. We will tonight too, and see you next year. Thank you.